Good morning. You know farmers start early, so I'm pleased to give the first talk this morning about nature and agriculture, the evolving relationships, plural. Let me see in which direction I need to point. Not yet. Now, I ask three questions. How did agriculture and agriculture related people evolve? What are the fundamental drivers and relationships of technical and institutional changes around innovations in agriculture? And what agriculture evolution in the future in a world of nine billion, which we will probably have later this century? Um, I start out with uh, agriculture and evolution, then on science, and then on sustainability issues of agriculture today and implications for science and research. Huh? You want to? Sorry. <coughs> Maybe I go closer to where they are. Somehow it doesn't work. Forward. I can give you a sign and you, you move. No, no, just a moment. We try. This okay. is not an okay, agriculture okay. technology. This is okay. one too far. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, ice age, 20,000 years ago, people were hunter-gatherers in the area, in the regions where we expect, where we know that agriculture popped up about 14,500 years ago when it started warming. The relationship between agriculture change and climate in history are pretty close. People started planting rye. This is uh, the little photo on the, on the bottom right. The excavation site at Abu Hureya in Syria, people think that's where the first cultivated rye was found. Today, archaeologists actually disagree on the causality regarding climate impact on innovation. Um, by the way, Europe was home to not more than about 100,000 people in those times. For a long time, agricultural historians and archaeologists were speaking of an, a Neolithic revolution. Today, this branch of science and scientists and historians here, archaeologists, speak of an evolution in the Neolithic time. They find that a very important finding to which that profession has come in the last 10 years or so, that there was a long time of parallel handling of uh, foraging and, uh, and uh, uh, hunting, gathering uh, with elements of farming, not a step from one to the other very quickly in those regions where, where uh, agriculture evolved. Be it in Ecuador, where in the rainforest squash cultivation started, which probably was the first cultivated crop, or be it rice in uh, China, or um, rye and, and wheat in the, um, in the region I mentioned before. Land use changed dramatically in the last 200 years of the world. The world has about 134,000 square, million square kilometers, of which about 50 million square kilometers are used by cropland and pasture. So about 40% of terrestrial land is used for crops and pasture today. 
agriculture has taken over uh, the land which is usable. If you net out uh, desert, etc. Also within the forests, a lot of land use for, for crops is currently being used. The key point is the agriculture evolution making use of croppable and pasture land uh, is a fairly recent phenomenon. As I said, climate change was pretty fundamental for the change in the relationship between men and land use and men and crops and agriculture. Today we have a two-way relationship between climate, agriculture and sustainability. And in the future, climate change may reduce agriculture productivity and exacerbate undernutrition. The top map here, just to indicate, is a map of expected impact of climate change in the next generation on crop productivity, where it is reddish, um, productivity will go down in terms of grain production. And the bottom map is a map of the Global Hunger Index, uh, under Nutrition Index, and there is uh, an indication of the overlap between these two phenomena. But we have also the second issue, which is new in the evolution of the relationship between agriculture and nature, that agriculture itself exacerbates climate change. Land use change is uh, responsible for about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions um, today, which is a lot more than transport. Too fast. Agriculture today covering the world is, however, very diversely structured. What is read on this map is large scale agriculture in the world. On average, farms bigger than 100 hectares or 500 hectares. What is yellow? is the world's small-scale agriculture, typically less than one hectare per farm. A huge diversity. The block of small-scale agriculture is housed in Asia and Africa, large-scale agriculture in parts of Europe, former Soviet Union, North and South America, Australia. How come this hugely diverse uh, pattern which agriculture has, has taken? Historically, agriculture has started the same way. Well, small scale agriculture is mostly concentrated where most of the world's people are concentrated. But there are also institutional factors which have driven agriculture into this very small scale. In Asia and Africa, farms have until very recently, and in India still that's the case, become smaller and smaller today, not larger and larger. China has gone through the turning point. This graph shows the relationship today in small-scale Asia, Asian agriculture, the relationship between productivity growth and change in small farm size. And it's a positive relationship. So the forces are driving also in Asia and in the future also in Africa, farms to become bigger because it's more profitable <coughs> and that is a strong force for migration from rural to urban areas, a change in the relationship between also nature and agriculture. The relationships of agriculture 
to nature and nature to agriculture are full of surprising external effects, so-called indirect effects. <coughs> external effects, <coughs> number one, for instance, agriculture created demand for other sciences. <coughs> um, historians of mathematics uh, very much seem to agree that uh, uh, the simple and arduous task to remeasure fields in flooded areas of Egypt was, as, was at least as important for the creation of mathematical science as was the desire to, um, to predict the movement of the stars for identifying dates. So ag agriculture was a mover of basic science. Increased property, uh, demand for property rights also come out of agriculture. <coughs> establishing one of the key institutions which make economies grow today. So moving from under population pressure and the creation of markets to the evolution of land rights, individualization of land rights and property rights. Um, this is a force far beyond agriculture. I interject in each of these uh, three uh, brief chapters of my presentation at the end a question, how will the future look like in the relationship uh, around agriculture and, and nature, nature? So let me sum up here. Farm operations will increase in size with economic growth, urbanization, a change in aspiration, especially of young people uh, having access to internet and, and cell phone, etc. The emergence of new technologies and access to finance. That changes the farm structure in the world. By the way, small farms are not so bad for nature. If you do a simple correlation between farm size and degradation of natural resources, um, large farm size tends to correlate with more land and water systems degradation. So small tends to be, to connect to yesterday's lecture, in various respects more beautiful. Asia and Africa, which are home to 90% of the world's small farms, yeah, mind you, we are talking hundreds of millions of small businesses in the world, about 450 million farms smaller than two hectares, which house the largest number of poor people also. So we need to care about these transformations, also from an ethical and humanitarian perspective. So they are now at a turning point from small to somewhat larger, but that transition will take a very long time. To move from um, a one hectare average farm size to a 10 hectare average farm size. Um, I think the Vatican Garden is 70 hectares, just to, uh, to compare. Um, at, the, at twice the path of transformation which Europe took, takes 50 years to move from one to 10, twice the past. We haven't seen such fast transformation elsewhere. So they will be with us for a long time, these small farms. Next point, agricultural science, innovation, and nature. It's a famous graph uh, designed by Robert Fogel, Nobel laureate, uh, economics, uh, important economic demographer um, and scholar. Where there are uh, green arrows, sorry, we cannot read that, green arrows, there are um, technological events which relate to agriculture. Vogel still speaks of the, the first agricultural revolution at the Neolithic time. We talk the last 11,000 years here in this graph. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, so it's population uh, and, and time in this graph. The other green arrows point to the beginning of uh, the second agricultural revolution uh, in the 19th 
uh, century, uh, germ theory uh, overcoming livestock diseases and, and uh, food safety problems, all the way to the genome project on this axis. So agriculture was part of the science revolution. Innovations in agriculture just about kept up and keep up with needs, just about. The linear line, the Malthusian point <coughs> of world grain yields is shown there, but also the increments of yields are going down, so smaller increments. Fortunately, world population growth also has gone down quite drastically. Anyway, regarding the relationship between uh, nature and agriculture, it's an important feature that the world consumes more and more similar and produces more and more similar nation by nation. This little graph on the right hand side shows in the inner circle a similarity, a similarity index concentration in the year 2009 of supp uh, food supplies uh, country by country and the outer circle, the red one, of 1961. So between 61 and 2009, country by country variation of commodity composition in agricultural supply decreased by about 70 percent. So in terms of production and consumption, the world becomes more and more homogeneous. Parallel to that trend is the growing demand for natural in the global middle class. People live with more and more animals for consumption worldwide. <coughs> we are in the company of 20 billion chicken, a, a billion pigs, and 1.4 billion cattle. Um, the concentration of uh, these animal uh, populations has moved where people are, rather than in the old days, it was the opposite. The ratio is often uh, one to ten in number of people to number of, uh, of uh, sorry, number of uh, people, number uh, of animals. So. We have to deal with that. This is unsustainable this concentration of large-scale, homogeneous animal populations for consumption, let alone the ethical aspects of how humankind treats animals in uh, the large-scale production today. <coughs> it's environmentally um, non-sustainable. An important finding um, about uh, three decades ago by Hayami and Rutten was that agriculture innovations are very much induced. They are not just some uh, scientists uh, are thinking hard and producing science, they are, uh, and then innovations come about in agriculture. They are very much induced by scarcity of factors of production. So, Innovations come in response to change in demand and supply and scarcity of factors, especially innovations saving land and labor. We call this tec technical change is embodied in new and more productive inputs. If this relationship holds for the future, we may be um, on a constantly further evolving enhancement of technological change in, in, agri in and around agriculture. As land gets more scarce, water gets more scarce, and so on, the innovation process will continue. That's the, the optimistic scenario. To point you to the evolution of modern agriculture, times I've put this little trans slide together. Agronomy started with early scientific communities in the late 1700s, so with scientists 
who immediately became very internationally connected. Agricultural economics started also in the early 1800s with researchers whose names we still use in teaching today. Genetics, plant breeding, with Mendel all the way to Norman Borlaug, the wheat breeder and Peace Nobel laureate, so genetically modified organisms in the 1990s. Plant nutrition played a key role as a science um, evolving out of agronomy. Justus von Liebig, by the way, was its father. Um, he also, at least in the German-speaking world, pushed as rector of University of Munich to integrate the agriculture and agronomy schools into universities, declaring agriculture as a science. His, when he, that was his inaugural speech as rector of University of Munich. Agriculture has to become a science. It cannot be isolated in agronomy schools. It needs to connect to the basic science and it also can contribute to the basic science. That was his message. And to the surprise uh, of many, uh, the univer most universities in, in Germany at least followed that, um, that uh, uh, plea. How will the future in scientific innovations around agriculture look right? like genomics, transgenics, cisgenics, meaning transfers of genetic material within the same species, um, is changing the speed and opportunities in plant breeding already dramatically. Advances in cellular processes, transforming, for instance, the rice plant, so a C4 plant, utilizing plant microbial systems relationships <coughs> um, to harvest of <coughs> nitrogen from, uh, from the atmosphere, etc., are large-scale uh, projects. Software-assisted agriculture of precision. The, the idea, uh, we are not monitoring the field, but we monitor the individual grain plant in a field of of millions of plants and microdose fertilizer and, and, um, and crop control is not just the dream, but the software companies have joined agricultural technological innovations in California and elsewhere. Livestock engineering with biopharmaceuticals um, um, actually doing agro farming um, with pH, uh, blood plasma out of uh, tobacco plants and so on is already happening. So the relationship between pharmaceutical and agricultural industries become closer and closer. And the big question of how to overcome the shortage of water, um, having um, uh, saline um, tolerant plants uh, in coastal areas irrigated is um, a big science project in not only the Arab world. Let me close with a few remarks on sustainability of agriculture and nature. Last year was celebrated the uh, 300th anniversary of the inventor of the term of sustainability, uh, Mr. von Karlowitz invented that. He was a forester and uh, found out that uh, unless uh, forestry is uh, uh, sustainable and is not undermined by the mining industry, uh, where most of uh, wood products in those days went, agriculture will suffer, land use will become un unsustainable. So the word of Nachhaltigkeit, sustainability, is attributed to him. The demand for biological material is very large in proportion to the Earth's ecosystem supply today already. More than one third of what grows greenish on Earth is already used. Um, that's net primary production, we call that, uh, by humankind. That leaves less and less for other species, alters the composition of the atmosphere, reduces the levels of biodiversity, and constrains the ecosystem services of keeping, for instance, water clean. 
This is a map which my institute recently produced this year uh, on land and soil degradation. And uh, where it is uh, brownish, reddish, um, the anthropogenic degradation has progressed uh, significantly um, over the last 30 years. Um, you see that uh, this is not just an issue of uh, small farm agriculture areas, but it's a global phenomenon. Um, which uh, we need to keep in mind. By the way, next year is not only the year of light, but the United Nations have declared next year the year of soil. So light and soil can both deserve attention. The large and rich nations consume a lot of water from water-scarce regions of the world by means of the imports of their uh, raw materials uh, for industry and for food and feed. Uh, the bottom uh, blue bar is the United States. Uh, the next few are mostly European countries. So this is not just net water import embedded in the food and feed, but also of the machinery industry and so on. Uh, water is not appropriately priced, undermines the sustainability of agriculture and of nature. Around water, agriculture and nature relationships are getting into trouble in many hotspots of the world. So we are confronted with a set of system challenges. We want zero carbon emissions, we want zero waste of agro-biomaterial, we want low ecological footprints. We want sustainable production. These are very conflicting goals. To deal with them, a, um, an approach which we call bioeconomy, biologize the economy, um, is increasingly pursued. Virtually all richer nations and including a number of uh, the uh, large emerging economies over the last five years only have written themselves bioeconomy strategies in response to the opportunities of using biological materials differently and in response to the sustainability issues around agriculture. So that's a very fast-moving evolution in policy, and uh, there are large science investments happening um, on bioeconomy. We call bioeconomy the knowledge-based production and use of biological resources to provide products, processes, and services in all economic sectors. So biologize the economy far beyond agriculture and forestry embracing the chemical industries, uh, pharmaceutical, the housing industry, um, and uh, lots of others. Um, the idea is to draw on biomass, on industrial biotechnology, the utilization of carbon, graphene, uh, generated from CO2 or other non-fossil sea resources. That's the new idea, defossilize agriculture, and thereby make it not only agriculture, but the whole economy more uh, adaptable to, natural, to nature. In search for a new reconciliation conciliation of agriculture with nature, <coughs> we often see these three alternatives, which I think are, are not and should not be alternatives. So all into eco-agriculture, transform the world into an ecological agriculture which does not use fertilizer, pesticides, no GMOs, and so on. It would yield less. It requires drastic adjustments in consumption. It would be bad for the poor. Alternative two, increased agricultural resource use, more land, more water, would be destructive for nature and non-sustainable. Alternative three, expansion of innovation in agriculture. Large-scale science investments are needed to deal with the issues which I have briefly touched upon. They are needed in combination with adjustments in consumption and reduced waste in food and feed. I had asked uh, 
three questions at the beginning. Here are some tentative simplified answers. So I'd asked, how did agriculture and agriculture-related people evolve? Answer, very gradually, for a long time, but with dramatic acceleration of replacement of inherited nature in the past 200 years. And that will go on. What are fundamental drivers and relationships of technical and institutional change in agriculture? I had underlined that the interaction of population and income growth driving demand, where agriculture innovation is endogenous and pretty fast. But it's not sufficiently fast for sustainability of natural resource use. That's why we have the issues around soil, water, biodiversity. Lastly, what agriculture evolution in the future of a world of 9 billion plus? My answer would be agriculture needs accelerated innovation, large-scale more science investment to deal with these issues, and more embeddedness of agriculture in nature. <coughs> what does this mean? Um, the, the way we use land um, needs to embed more um, landscape environmental issues, needs to identify pathways for species across fields, islands of biodiversity uh, in crops, not just the maximization of yield of a certain monoculture in a crop, but uh, optimizing the relationships between um, agriculture and nature, field by field, landscape by landscape. Thank you for your attention.